Hey everybody, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Bill. Have you ever asked yourself, what is your superpower? Everyone has a superpower. Most people just don't know what it is. We're going to help you uncover it. This podcast is all about helping people figure out what their truly unique superpower is. Superpowers, what's yours? Hello and welcome to another episode of Superpowers. We have an incredible guest here with us today. For those in the industry, he needs no introduction, but because 57% of our viewers are outside the industry, uh, and that number's growing, uh, I'd like to introduce our next guest, Mr. Terry Kowaja. Uh, those of you who don't know Terry, uh, born and raised Canadian, uh, started his career uh, as an investment bank. I think it was Citi and Credit Suisse, if I have that correct. Uh, had, you know, worked at a bunch of boutique investment banking firms and then started his own shop about uh, 10 years ago. Um, he is known for his comedy. He is known, uh, you know, for kind of being, a, you know, greater than life. Uh, and people love him on stage. And I, I actually say I consider him more part of the kind of digital media digital marketing, digital advertising, data ecosystem, more than I consider him a banker. Terry, thank you for joining us. This is great. Great to be with you guys, Bill and Chris. Welcome to the show. Terry, um, Bill, when you were doing that bio about all those great things, I thought you were talking about me, and I was waiting for <laughs> Terry to get his intro. But I, I, I echo Bill's uh, fantastic introduction to someone that um, – that is a friend, a mentor, and someone that is doing incredibly great work for the industry. And Terry, we've known each other personally, but so happy to have you officially on the Superpowers Podcast Show. Wish this was down at the studio together, so I can. I'm a toucher. I like to, you know, touch people while the show's going on. No, Those days. No, are but um, Terry, let's start before we have a lot to cover. How how are you, where are you? How are you and your family doing doing um, during this uh, this pandemic? Um, any insights in regards to what you guys are doing at a personal level before we get into you? Well, thanks thanks, Chris. Um, we are here in New York City, in the Upper East Side, otherwise known as the epicenter. Um, uh, but uh, in reality, we're, we're perfectly fine. Everyone's in good health. Uh, we are sequestered in our apartment. We tend to go out once a day. I'll go for a run in the park or uh, just to walk around the block just to sort of get outside and get some get some fresh air. But otherwise, we're pretty much on lockdown. And um, what I found is uh, I'm able to sort of get uh, be relatively efficient, um, pretty busy with uh, Zoom calls and good old fashioned phone calls and uh, cranking out a lot of content and getting a lot of work done. So, so far we have been uh, lucky in the sense that uh, we've not been that disrupted from a day-to-day -day standpoint. Exactly. Other than the food. Knock on wood. And Terry, you have two sons. How are they doing and how's homeschooling going? Yeah, I've got a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. And what's been amazing to me is how rapidly they adopted to their new reality of online uh, schooling. Um, literally, here I was hovering around them saying, is everything okay? And, you know, how are you managing in this transition? They're like, what, dad? That was like yesterday. Uh, yeah. they, they just, they're, they're so elastic, right? They just, this became their new normal almost immediately. And it's kind of like no big deal. I, occasionally I get called in for IT support on something, but <laughs> otherwise uh, they're kind of good to go, which is incredible. I think we're, I think it's safe to say we're all IT support these days. I, I just uh, I just tweeted this the other day, which is the the ability to unplug and restart from an IT perspective takes you a very very long way. Our our boys are similar in age, uh, Terry, and I I, I want to echo that sentiment. I think you and I uh, shared shared comment on this about a week ago, but three weeks ago or three and a half weeks ago, terrified with the idea of them being home for all the same kind of reasons of this going into this unknown, but they are extremely resilient and yeah. I think they actually enjoy it more. And, um, and um, yeah, you learn how to be a good PE teacher and, and, uh, and how to hunker down, but we're, it's, I think number one, once the family, you know, your family and your kids are good, everything else can fall into line. Yeah, all right, all hey. I can say is thank, thank God for the telcos and their five, nine reliability. I mean, Verizon 
18, I mean, without broadband and our phones, we'd be in a very different experience right now. Hey, Terry, just quick, quick one. Either say up, down, or same. Um, exercise. Up. Drinking. Up. <laughs> Sex. Same. All right, that's good. Um, food. Oh, up. I, I finally get to find out. We, we have a, a, a person who cooks for us and takes care of the kids. And the, the, the food is so good. And I've been missing out this whole time on these amazing lunches. I'm like, this is like gourmet every day. It's incredible. <laughs> and my wife is like, oh, that's every day. You're at work. I'm like, ah, OK, now I get it. I might, you know, nice. going forward, I may do work from home a little bit more often. OK, and then last one, meetings um same yeah yeah i i gotta tell you i i i feel the same way uh other than the sex part i mine is up um <laughs> um you know it, it it's amazing that i kind of feel like i'm more efficient now than i've ever been uh you know kind of like you realize how inefficient travel is you know uh just yeah. banging out meetings all day every day um and the fact that we can all see each other and you can get connected and video conference is just damn efficient. I, I kind of feel like business may never be the same again. Well, I'm, I'm most certainly on a variety of fronts when we, when, and we, when we get back to normal, can't be soon enough, but yep. we have to do it the right way. Um, I think there'll be a number of things that will be different. Yeah. Terry, yeah. Terry to piggyback on Bill's list, which I think is great, um, any new hobbies uh, or things that you've picked up that's been in kind of on, on hold because you haven't had the time uh, or, or anything fun, a new board game, a book or any little kind of anything creatively that you've, you've started to do in the last three or four weeks? You know, uh, I, there's a sort of like a general philosophy that I have with respect to the impact of this coronavirus. And that is that, I, yes, I suppose it's breeding some new habits, but in, for the most part, what it's doing, what I've found at least, is it's accelerating the what what you were already doing before, it's just accelerating that. So if there was yeah. like the consult, industry consolidation, it's accelerating that. Um, you know, uh, and in, in my life, you know, I, I like to crank out these, uh, you know, creative projects, both, both work product and co comedic uh, product. Uh, when I when I have the time, and what I found is in the last two weeks, I've just been hyper efficient at being able to crank out more. So I'm not sure, Chris. It, there are different habits. It's just that I'm able to sort of do more of the same. So it's kind of like steroids. Yeah. All like right. So steroids. So uh, so obviously this is the superpowers podcast. We try to uncover everyone's unique superpower. Uh, what we like to do is. Start from the very beginning. We want to know what a young little Terry um, sitting somewhere in Canada was like. Um, brothers, sisters, what your parents did. Give us the give us the young Terry. The young Terry. All right. So um, I'm 57. Uh, that means I was born in late 1962 in Quebec, in a very very small remote town where my dad was stationed at a paper mill. And I, so I grew up in, in Quebec in a variety of provinces on the Eastern coast of Canada and a little bit in, in Massachusetts, go Boston, Chris. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, I, uh, I was the middle child, an older brother, younger sister, all relatively- By the way, you're, the th you're our third um, podcast this week, all middle children, all incredibly successful. Well, and, and, and I had the middle child syndrome, which is, you know, the older uh, brother got spoiled because he was the first. My parents were like experimenting on parenting uh, with him. And then the younger sister was the princess. So she got away with anything and I kind of got stuck in the middle. Um, but uh, in reality, I had a, had a fun childhood. Um, I was always the jokester, prankster. I know, what a shock. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of was uh, always sort of striving for attention and trying to do things that, I uh, got a light out of people. And when I, when I was able to do that, when I cued into what worked, I was like, huh, interesting. I'll do more of that. Yeah. So um, there was uh, a lot of fun in, in childhood. Interestingly, I became the family photographer. 
Uh, I was pretty good at it. And uh, this is back in the Polaroid days, of course. Um, uh, and yet one of the consequences of that is there are virtually no pictures of me as a child. I mean, there's, I got a handful of them. That's it, everyone else, because I was the one uh, on the other side of the camera. Most of the time. And then as a middle child, you get to complain about no pictures, you know, oh. being like, oh, there's no pictures of me. Absolutely. Except, except the ones that we dug up, Terry, except the ones that we 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 uh, we put our oh, investigators yeah. on, I'm, when, I'm which, sure. will be, which will be on the interwebs later. We yeah. had one of our first guests in season one, Terry, was the foodie magician, Josh Beckerman, in case you watched that episode, blew Bill's mind uh, at the studio. And while that is his true life profession, not uh, not M&A in media and technology, what were were there some things at an early age, whether it was magic or laughs, like what specifically was it that you sort of identified with where it was this ability to get attention? What were the tools that you were doing? What was that moment? And like if we did have your brother, was it brother or sister? Sorry? Yeah, brother and a sister, yeah. If we had them on, what would they say about you? And honestly, and F bombs are okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, that, I'll go in reverse order. Attention hog probably is what they would say. Um, although I was always the, like, it's it's one thing you like commanding attention, but the other thing is you got to deliver the goods. Like if you can be yeah. funny and quippy, then you know I kind of you, you got to earn the microphone, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, well, we grew up sort of lower middle class. I mean, I, I, the teeny little 1,100 square foot bungalow that I grew up in in Toronto once we settled down where the you know nine and a half by nine and a half foot room that I shared with my brother in bunk beds I never thought anything of it I just thought that was sort of normal I look back on that now and you know now I find myself telling my kids look in in when I was your age it sort of that yeah. doesn't work but um well there was a, there was a few moments Chris uh that were sort of teachable moments um that are sort of vignettes of my life where I sort of learn learn certain things at the age of six i met my aunt's wedding in prince edward island and as a joke i dress up like a gangster i have this fake gun and i decide to go upstairs and stand outside the loo outside the bathroom and every time uh, someone came out of the bathroom i'd say stick them up and uh, uh they would take out the coins back when people used coins uh, in their pocket and held them out and the first guy slapped his hand all the coins went all over the floor and he was like, yeah, you get him, kid. And he and he walked downstairs and I picked up all these coins. <clears throat> and I did the same thing to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. It was a wedding, so there was a lot of people. And at the end of the night, uh, I had $6.77, which to a six-year-old in 1968, let me tell you something, it was all the money in the world. A lot of money. So the, the, what I learned from that episode was crime pays. Uh, no, but uh, seriously, <laughs> Um, that 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 if you if you can you know if you can be creative if you can do so a good narrative can 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 earn you something so so that was a good that was a good lesson. Um, years later, I'm uh, I'm I'm in Toronto and I bought a paper route. I said bought a paper route. I took over a paper route because yeah. at the age of nine, a, a neighbor came to me and he said, "Hey, uh, I am moving on Friday. This is now a Tuesday." And uh, I, you know, do you want to buy my paper route? It's a really cool thing. And I'm like, hmm. And I kind of drag my feet. Wednesday, Thursday, the guys come after. Are you sure? Are you, can I convince you to buy the? Well, by Friday, of course, he has to just hand me the keys to it. Um, so I learned something there. Uh, and I actually had that for five years. And by the end of it, I had four people actually delivering the newspapers. We expanded. And I bought other did you, ever, did you ever have to yell, I want my two dollars? Did that ever come <laughs> out of your come out of your mouth? Better no, off I did learn about right? cash I flow, I learned about it. operating leverage, I learned about capital cost, like just invaluable stuff. Yeah. Now at, at a cost though, right? I mean, every day after school from age nine to fourteen. I, for an hour and a half, I was delivering the newspapers or supervising people who were delivering the newspapers. The word, the word, by the way, the worst was collect. <laughs> right? Collect. Yeah. Because, you know, there were no credit, like people didn't pay by credit cards. You literally oh, knocked oh, on oh. doors and all you said was collect, which meant you had to pay for the newspapers. It's It was, it, collect was hard. Well, and then you, those are another set of skills you got to learn, right? Where... Yeah. You know, maybe a good, you know, remember that that six year old lesson about the good narrative and, and or, you know, and invoking your creative skills or comedic skills. 
that's helpful too in terms of getting people to pay. So, you know, yeah. Now, now, Terry, were you um, at, when you were doing this? Were it, were you more focused on sort of the idea of the of the biz, the hustle and the small business? Were you also finding time for sports? And then uh, um, segue that into we asked about your your siblings. Also, Bill and I always love to understand a little bit about parents and what you what you learned and observed from your mom and dad and, 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 and what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, um, yeah, uh, dad was an engineer who became a, a, a manager, a very, very smart guy. So he graduated top of his class, he went to Harvard Business School, he was a Baker wow. Scholar. So he was like a really smart guy. Uh, so, so, that, so that didn't come to you? No, not <laughs> at all. You're, you're funny. So, so he was book smart. Mom was street smart. Yeah. And and I like to say I, I captured just enough of the of the two of them for that combination. But what, my, what very importantly, my dad didn't have the best career. Um, he sort of tail it, it really sort of ended uh, on a on a whimper. And and he didn't. What I, what I learned was he didn't manage his career. Like in other words, he was good at his job, but he didn't prioritize himself. That taught me uh, uh, tons in terms of. Uh, making sure that I was, you know, looking out for for you know who, um, yeah. as I as I went through an added value in, in in my career in other ways because it turns out it's not good enough to just be good at your day job. You also have to make sure that others don't sort of run roughshod over you. You know, I I had a conversation with my daughter recently about kind of quote unquote playing the game, um, and you know, and and told her I was like you you're not you you got to learn how to play the game. Um, oh, yeah. It's so important because being great isn't enough. You nope. gotta, you gotta network. You gotta play the game. You gotta understand connections, and you gotta speak up. And you gotta, and you gotta have a plan. You, you know? gotta speak up. And and the other thing is, you know, be opportunistic. Like seize the moment. Um, yeah. I'm I'm back on my paper road. Right. I'm delivering papers. I'm now 14, and I read in. Uh, so the one thing uh, that was a unforeseen advantage of delivering the newspapers was I read them. So I read the newspaper like every day from age nine to 14. Um, and and uh, that's not usual, I don't think, or at least not wasn't in, in the 1970s. And um, I read on page like B17 or whatever, there was, a, there was an official notice that uh, Brewers Retail, the sort of uh, co the government regulated co-op of beer stores in Canada, everyone gets their beer in one place and we drink a lot of beer in Canada. So um, they announced that starting in two weeks, they would change the refund amount from five cents a bottle to 10 cents a bottle. And it's religion, but like more so than church, Canadians every Saturday morning bring their empties of their cases of beer back <laughs> to brewers retail, they get their cash and then they buy the next week's batch. And um, so I'm like, I looked at this, I read it and I reread it and I said, wait a second, are they pre-announcing the doubling of price of a commodity publicly? Really? <laughs> and so you know, I called up my friend Dino and I said, does your dad, uh, uh, does he use his painting truck on the weekends? Answer, no. I'm like, great. And can he drive us somewhere this Saturday? And he goes, sure, what, what do you got? What's up? So I take my, you know, changer, we take the van, we park it in front of Brewers Retail at 9.55, five minutes before it opens, open up the back doors, and we're buying empties from everybody for five cents, uh, and we're doing it quickly. We notice we're missing some people, so I go into the Brewers Retail, and I'm like, hey, we're a couple kids. We're buying empties from people out there. If you want to do less work and you want to help the kids, just direct them out there. So they did. They put up a sign saying, "Go, go the kids will take care of you. And so we were just, we filled up the van four times over two Saturdays, and then just brought them back the next weekend with our commodity doubled in price. And we start bringing them in the front door and they're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. How much you got? I said, four vans full. I'm like, okay, okay. Bring it around the back to the loading dock. And we unloaded and we made $4,000. No, you didn't. In, no, you didn't. Yes, $4,000. How old were you? I was 14. That's awesome. So this is 1977. I can't even drive. I got $4,000. So we split it 2000, 2000. And, you know, here we were, Mr. Mr. Delarletta gave us a drive. So like I'm hand in him, like here's, 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 <laughs> here's, 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 here's
By the way, there was a Seinfeld episode about this when uh, when Kramer That's figured true. out it was ten it was ten cents in Wisconsin. Yeah. They, they I didn't have to drive across the country. When I saw that episode, I just killed myself laughing. Yeah, it's Newman. And and I had to borrow the capital from my dad, right? This required capital in order to, you know, you uh, need money to make money. I didn't have any money. So what was your dad's cut? What was your dad's cut? Well, no, I cut him in. I cut him in. I, I gave him. I gave him a decent uh, return. In fact, I gave him. He goes, no, I don't deserve all of this. And I said, yes, you do. And and so, I parlayed that into another sort of opportunity. I was buying cars. I would buy a car for a summer, and then I would I would clean it up. I detail it myself, and then sell it uh, at the end. And I remember my dad was a very sort of risk averse uh, guy, yeah. and I was sort of. You know, calculated risks were, were a good thing. And when my brother's girlfriend's father had a car coming off lease, and it was a beautiful 1976 uh, Monte Carlo SE in midnight blue with a white Landau roof. I'm talking Pimp Mobile. Wow. This Remember thing the details. was unbelievable. And he said, you can, you can buy it for 1200 bucks. And I'm like, Dad? I need capital. And he goes, oh, I don't know about this. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Give me the capital. Give me the capital. So he gives capital. me the capital. <laughs> He's the only 14-year-old going, Dad, I need the capital. I need the capital. <laughs> so I no, no, I was 16 at this point because I had to okay. drive, right? So so and I I I drove it all summer, like just and you know, a 16-year-old driving that car, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. That was like pretty freaking hey. awesome. And then I uh, detailed it, and I sold it, and I made like a couple grand profit, and I gave it to, uh, I gave him a cut of it, and he was like, "This is unbelievable," and I said, "That's capital. That's what capital can." You're, do. you're basically like the Canadian version of Alex P. Keaton. And so when Alex P. Keaton came out, I was like, "Oh my god!" Everyone in my family was like, "Did they make a TV show about you?" Yeah, I was. Uh, you know how they say if you're not like a socialist at age 20, you have no heart, not a liberal at age 30, you have no soul, and not a capitalist at age 40, you have no brains or money. Um, well, I kind of went in the opposite direction. I was slightly right of Genghis Khan at 18. So, uh, I mean, and then I got some some perspective. You're, you're, I'm watching, I'm deep into uh, Narcos Mexico right now, and there's, uh, as you talked about, sort of doling out cash to all these, uh, to, to, to all your your team here that helped you make your your money uh, it reminds me of uh, the the that flow. Terry, what was the um, what was it like? What was your perception of the United States at that age? What was it like living in Canada at that age? But more, well, I'm just curious. Like, how did you perceive the world looking across the border? Uh, huh? And good question. Um, so obviously, you know, we're growing up, we get the Canadian news and we get all the American news, right? In Toronto, we would get yep. uh, the ABC, NBC and CBS affiliates from Buffalo. So, uh, you know, American TV and American TV shows and Hollywood is exactly the same uh, in Canada. It's just that we had, in addition, we had Canadian uh, news uh, as well. I was a big admirer of uh, America uh, growing up. In fact, you know, Again, talk about bizarre politics. You know, I'm, I'm, I, my two favorite presidents of all time are Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan. You know, figure that one out, right? Um, but uh, yeah, um, by the way, you can pay therapists to to help you figure that out. This is no, this is this. Is, uh, <laughs> oh, this is oh, we're the therapist. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what the show is, Bill. So, yeah, no, I was, uh, I would look, I looked at the United States, uh, uh, you know, uh, with sort of realistic eyes. We used to joke in history class in Canada, we would, uh, the, our history professor would literally show us a book, a history book from the United States and read from it. We'd all like get a good laugh because according to the history books, um, by the way, much of them are corrected now, but they had Canada, or sorry, they had America winning the war of 1812 and, 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 and winning, you know, in Vietnam. I'm, we're like, <laughs> that's funny. Oh, yeah, well, okay, I, I, but, but I, I in general, I was positive about the U.S. So, so you you go to college where in Canada or U.S.? Uh, I I I went to all of I did all of my education in a country with socialized education. So um, I went. Oh, to, so so oh, I forgot you're you were Alex P. Keaton. So you went where the college was free. You bet, or close to free. I mean, you yeah. know. But, but put it this way, uh, I went to uh, undergrad, I studied economics and statistics at the University of Western Ontario, and then I studied law school at Osgoode Hall Law School and, and business school at the Shulman School of Business.
from the be so it was a lot of by, by the way are you are you a lawyer i didn't know that yeah yeah wow I mean, I did the AD MBA combined uh degree five years of schooling and four uh but but so when i started university it was 1200 bucks a year tuition and when i finished it was like 2500 it was it was nothing absolutely nothing and by the end i was like a teacher aid making 20 grand a year. So I actually made money on my education. And, and Terry, that on top of uh, um, um, outside of education, you have your, uh, you have medical uh, covered as well, right? Uh, in, in Canada. Yeah. 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 yeah, you and I, have, I think we've talked Not about like this. Like every other Western nation uh, on this planet, but for this one, yep. Mm -hmm. No, your quote, your Canada sounds great. It's not as great as Finland, which you always give me, you tease me about. Still the happiest place on earth and leading with education um, and health. But Canada is that same bucket, Terry. Well, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, happy, any of these, whether it's happiest places or best quality of life, there's Finland and Canada are both in the top 10. Yeah. Finland's usually in the top five. Which, which, by the way, definitely in the top 10, but hey. Which, by the way, is crazy because if you visit Finland outside of the summer, it is probably the most depressing place you could go with two hours of daylight and a high level of alcoholism. But hey, when hey. when when edu but 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 kid, kid but aside, good at filling out the surveys, I guess. When education yeah. and uh, and health uh, is something that you for the average family does, is not a burden. Um, that that's a that's a that's a freedom. Yeah. So, so Terry, so, okay. So, so you do a whole bunch of schooling. When do you get to the U S was it your first job uh, or. So, uh, I mean, look, I, I had, I had summer jobs and for nine years, I worked at a golf course. So I was Carl Spackler, uh, from Caddyshack, uh, um, for, uh, for nine years at the same golf club with, you know, all these, you know, wealthy, uh, members. And I was like the worker guy. Um, that was kind of an interesting dynamic. Uh, that was like a sociology class in and of itself. Uh, yep. But yeah, my first real job. So I went straight through uh, uh, and it was 26 years old when I finally finished school, kind wow. of late start on, on life and my first job. So here I am in, you know, law and business school in the 80s, in the mid 80s, when everything is the ships hitting the fan in terms of M&A, hostile takeovers, and there's all yep. this dynamism. And I was like, oh, yeah, I suppose I could do what every other Canadian does and go to work on Bay Street. It's the Canadian version of Wall Street uh, in Toronto. Or, but the action is in New York. Uh, I was basically completely disinterested in anything but going to work on Wall Street and, you know, by, by hook or by crook, because the, you know, Solomon Brothers, none, none of the uh, major Wall Street balls bracket firms even recruited at our school. I yeah. basically forced my way down to New York, forced my way into interviews, and basically hired myself uh, at Solomon Brothers in 1989. And uh, yeah, um, just lived hard. Well, so 1989, that's that's post, like Reagan was uh, eating his post jelly crash. beans. Post 87 um, crash. And, yep. and the 87, 88 crash. So the, like, the, it was not a great time in 89. It's, no, and in fact, 1990, there was a real estate crash, and they fired yeah. uh, six months into the job. They fired one third of the class ahead of me. So that taught me that okay, uh, you're on, pal. It's like performance time, and they're gonna call like a big proportion of your class. So yes, this is this will be an incredible career if if you can keep your job. And uh, that, I mean, talk about lighting a fire and and causing all kinds of stress and lots of other things, but it was so, trial by fire. So Terry, we, we know you as, uh, you know, the guy who, you know, goes deep uh, for an investment banker, really, really knows the industry, uh, but also your, your parody videos and comedy. Um, what were you like as kind of like a junior associate, like a, you know, first, second, fourth year Wall Street kid? Yep. Well, I was lucky in that purge of 1990. I mentioned they got rid of a, the big chunk of the class ahead of me, and of course, in 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 a series of purges, basically there was like no one ahead of my class for like three or four years. So it was trial by fire. I kind of got elevated to running deals as early as like 1991. So I I uh, that was uh, beneficial, and uh, you know it was it was around that time where I started doing comedy. In fact, I was doing comedy my first year there, 
it made it so that um, it was helpful. I think it's sort of a, an effective tool to sort of grease the skids in terms of you know getting deals done, boardroom humor. Um, I have a set of rules. I did a webinar on comedy and business where I talk about five rules and you know be yeah. good at your day job, make sure you're funny and pick your spots and a bunch of stuff that uh, I think what I've learned over you know doing comedy for uh, for for many decades now. But uh, one interesting thing I did was um, we had this annual outing. And the whole investment bank would get together and play golf or tennis at some fancy uh, uh, club up in up in Westchester, up up near where you know uh, Chris lives in the fancy fancy places, right? And um, and so after the golf, you know, everyone would shower up and then come in before the dinner and be but for a dinner. But before the dinner, there would be this comedy segment we would do, basically do a weekend update style. Uh, format where I would take down the most powerful people uh, in at the firm. So think Ricky, what Ricky Gervais. A roast. You were doing a roast. Called. You were doing a roast. I, I was doing a roast. I was doing a roast in the form of this sort of uh, news thing. And you know, I did this for six or seven years, and it became the highlight of the. I mean, people would come up just for that, and it became such. And this, well, by the way, this was not kid glove sort of middle of the road pablum stuff. This was eviscerating, brutal takedowns of the senior most powerful people and senior people at the firm. And it was funny because it was true. Like we really yeah. sort of had that community of interest. And and we and, and and Solomon Brothers had this sort of very sharp elbowed culture. So no other comedy would even work at Solomon. You actually had to come at someone with an ax and take them down. And it became such that the senior most powerful people wanted to ensure that I was going to pick on them because if I didn't, then eh, maybe they didn't. They're a little soft. Team. So yeah. people wore like a badge of honor uh, and it elevated me to a level on as a peer to these partners because I was the one able, I was the court jester able to, to take them down. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like the perfect scenario when you get to actually use your, uh, your skills and passion and not get, not get ridiculed for it. And actually be praised for it. Well, it's it's I call it it's it's my version of Maslow's self-actualization, right? I am going to hit the pinnacle on that pyramid if I can do my day job and and benefit my day job career by doing what I love to do, uh, which is the the comedy stuff. So if I can somehow do the double upper, then then that's it. I'm self-actualizing. It's like Terry out. Hey hey Terry, have you ever actually done stand-up comedy? Yes. You have. Yes, and 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 I and I've done it in a pure. I do it to test material, or I did it to test material. So I did it pure, which is to say, I didn't I didn't pre-announce I was going to you know uh, amateur mic night at Caroline's or wherever, and and have all my friends pile in and yeah. support me. I thought that ah, that's bullshit. Uh, that's a could be a false positive. I would go unannounced to an open mic night, often after working till like midnight at the yeah. office on deals. And then I'd have a set, right, that I'd prepare, and I would go usually on the Upper West Side to a, a comedy shop, and I just rattled this off. The funny thing was they were all drunk at that point. The audience is drunk, and and I would try out materials and uh, look varying degrees, but mostly pretty damn good. Um, the the comedy people wanted me to come back. I was of course you know busy as an investment banker, so it was just a hobby thing. Hey Terry. Terry, since 1989, have you lived in New York City since 1989 then? Correct. I've been wow. here for years. Wow. You're more of a New Yorker than almost anyone now. <laughs> yeah. Feels like it sometimes. So, so, um, so you, so you were at Solomon, uh, Solomon, uh, now city. Uh, you did go, you did switch banks at one point, right? Yeah, in fact, I, I left Wall Street to in in uh, a perfect timing, March of 2000, right, right at the S&P yep. um, and joined a company, uh, a startup uh, that had already had $175 million of private funding back when you needed a lot of money. It was a uh, it was a virtual it was a it was a video conferencing business of all uh, 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 things. And uh, and back then you needed blade your own blade servers. There was no such thing as the cloud. So we raised a ton of money from everybody and their sister, um, uh, Microsoft, Panasonic, uh, SoftBank, you name it. Um, and um, I joined as the CFO, the last amendment to the red before the, before the 
perspectives went final and we went uh, public. And of course, we all know what happened in 2000. We still made it out. Um, we were in fact pricing the deal on the on the uh, trading floor at Solomon Brothers in July of 19. I'm oh, sorry, of 2000, uh, when the we're pricing the deal after having come back from the European version of the roadshow on the Air France. Uh, um, um, what do they call that supersonic jet? Concords. A Concord, right? When the Concord blew up. We no. were watching it blow up. We were on that same exact flight a week prior. So we we got the company out. Um, uh, long story short, uh, lost our currency when the market went down. Made every number as a public company CFO, uh, but we ended up uh, selling the business. I came back to the street, worked at Credit Suisse uh, for a year until they bought me out of my uh, ridiculous contract, um, and then I went off and did other things. So, so by the way, uh, look before we get off of Solomon. I, I believe you were at least one of the bankers on the richest deal in M&A history, correct? Correct. In fact, I was the lead M&A banker, the one with the signature on the, uh, on the engagement letter for uh, AOL Time Warner. Now, this is a deal, this is a very infamous deal uh, that has been seen as the... Uh, uh, you know, worst deal of all time. And I think that is a function of depending on which side. So it's as, you know, m and is largely a zero sum game. So when people say it was the most disastrous deal and there's a litany of uh, unfortunate souls whose 401ks were eviscerated because they worked for Time Warner, think about it. My client, AOL, was able to conduct what in hindsight was the greatest legal but unwarranted transfer of wealth ever in the history of man. $55 billion transferred from uh, Time Warner shareholders to AOL shareholders for, for no particular logical reason, other than the fact that we convinced them to agree to the deal. Uh, yes, it was a disaster. It was probably a deal that was 20 years ahead of its time, but think about it. Combining media and, and internet delivery it seems like a no-brainer today. And, it was yeah. Uh, yeah. too early. And like I said, you know, my client's still happy today. Um, success has a thousand uh, fathers, and yet, you know, I, I still have the engagement letter with my signature on it, framed in my um, uh, uh, in my uh, office on on the wall. Because at sixty million dollars, that was my fee for that deal. That was the at the time the highest fee ever received in an M and A deal. Uh, for the biggest M&A deal ever announced. Again, uh, all of the time it's been surpassed at this point, but um, it's, it was a hell of, a, hell of an experience. So, so, so most of the bankers, most of the investment bankers I know, you know, charge points on a deal. How, how does one negotiate the fees on a $55 billion acquisition? Yeah, $183 billion acquisition uh, was that the, actual, uh, the actual value of the deal. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, there was no precedent, obviously, for a deal of that size. And um, my uh, the chairman of the investment bank uh, basically relegated me to sort of prepare that conversation with the CFO of AOL. And I had my I had my you know my analysis prepared. Um, and you know he said to me, are, "Are you ready? You ready for the conversation?" I said, "I'm ready for when they're ready." In other words. We were heads down working that deal. Yep. There was four days we didn't sleep where over the weekend uh, leading up to January 10th, 2000, uh, we were doing all the due diligence and financial work and fairness opinion and board presentations and all of that. It was literally four days with no sleep. And yet, you know, uh, I was prepared for that conversation when and if uh, it needed to happen. And of course, my, my boss said, look, look, I have to be there for that negotiation. Do not do that on your own. I said, oh, okay, no problem. I'll, well, I'll find you. And uh, sure enough, on the Saturday night, we're at a law firm and we're working late. And then the CFO grabs me by the arm and he says, I need, I need, I need you for five minutes. So he pulls me out into the hallway and he goes, okay, uh, I need to talk to you about the fee. And I'm like, oh, okay. And boom, I had my full, you know, I had my, I had two pages. Yeah. Two pages of support for the, what was going to be the biggest ask of an M&A fee in the history of the world, $60 million. 
And uh, I'm like, great, hang on a second, let me just get Eduardo. And I'm looking in the room, he's gone. He's I, I can't find him. And he goes, gotta go. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And he goes, what, so what's your what's your proposal? I know you have one. And I said, yeah, so here, here's the thing. I could justify 80 uh, based on these numbers, boom, 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 and these deals. I'm asking for 60, I think it's the right number. It's fair, bada bing, bada boom. And, he, and he's like, looks it over. He's like, okay, fine. And I said, okay, well then here, here, uh, here you go. <laughs> I, I, I write in 60, my handwriting, and I'm like, there's, you know, my hand shaking probably. I'm like, initial here, initial and initial and sign. He goes, gotta go. I said, no, no, hang up, hang up. Second copy, s s sign this one. <laughs> Second copy, sir. He no, no. And he goes, look, there's bigger, bigger issues going on in back in that room. I gotta get back in there. He goes in the room. I'm standing there, sort of dumbfounded, holding on to this engagement letter. Incredible. And at that moment, Eduardo comes out of the men's room zipping up. Like he looks over at me and he goes, What? And he goes, It's done. He said, What do you mean it's done? He goes, I told you. I said, I looked for you. He goes, Okay, hey, what'd you get? I said, I got the ask. And he goes, Really? <laughs> he goes, How'd you do it? I said, Kind of just like that. He goes, Really? Holy shit. He goes, You can negotiate every engagement letter from now on. He goes, It was unbelievable. So we wow. were just going, like, Holy crap. By the way, I have to I have to apologize for the for the viewers. Hopefully, this is maybe you you're watching it on a podcast. I haven't gotten a haircut in like two and a half months, and I'm and I'm, every day I tried to figure out like what to do with my hair. It's not Mario good. Seagulls, you're, 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 we're just going back to the. Yeah, age. your hair looks great, man. I'm gonna. I, you just need some. You just need some good wax. You're yeah. Wax in I need, your life. Yeah. yeah. Listen, listen to the master. So Terry, yeah. you um, you you crossed the border. We never even had a chance to talk about how much I love Canadian beer. Hopefully, there's time for that. Um, you and I met. I want to. We got to jump. We got to jump forward. Um, um. So during the GCA days, if I recall, it was around two two thousand seven, two thousand eight zone. Yep. I think around the time you and I met, which was the year I started App Savvy, and I um, I want to. What I really wanted to kind of talk about there was, you know. Your your time there, sure, but also kind of the beginning of the Luma, um, the Luma scape, the Luma chart, which I know a lot of people. Whether I'm sure there's a lot of people that may may or may not have the connection as it relates to you or your or your or your uh, or your firm. But can we talk a little bit about the development and and how that came to origin? Um, yeah, let me let me let me also just jump in here. Um, I, I mean, it's interesting because Terry and I over the last 15 years each have like three career moves, each which um, coincided with each other. Um, you know, when we were both at a smaller, uh, he was at a, a smaller boutique investment firm and I was at a boutique uh, ad tech firm, uh, you know, and I, I left to go to Media Bank, he left to go to GCA, then, uh, then, I, was, um, then I was merging with, oh no, no, so, no, that's when I sold. Then I went to Right Media. We sold to Yahoo. Yeah. Uh, you went to GCA. Then I was going to Media Bank, which eventually became Media Ocean, as you were thinking about starting Luma. Um, yeah. And and so you know, for those of you you know listening, um, people may think the advertising landscape is kind of simple, but the supply chain is actually pretty complex and certainly right. very fragmented. Uh, Terry is the author of what he calls the Lumascapes, which is the landscape um, of the of the ecos of the various ecosystems. Yeah, how did you come up with the idea? Because it was brilliant. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Lumascape, um, you know, is is basically uh, you know hundreds and hundreds of logos broken into categories for the supply chain for various parts of the digital ecosystem, and it ends up in almost every single pitch deck, in all these board decks, uh, in M&A transactions. I mean, it was brilliant. Um, it's been viewed, I think, in more countries than have coronavirus. Uh, <laughs> and uh, But I, yeah, it's, I'm very curious as to how you came up with the idea to do it. So, uh, I'm a graphical person, right? And it turns out there's science behind this, right? People, uh, your brain can process graphics 62 times faster than text and you will retain that image. Uh, you store it in a different part of the brain. So text gets stored up here, graphics back here, and it's and the storage is much more uh, visceral and, and longer lasting. And so as a graphical person, I discovered graphics were far better 
uh, presentation tool. Recall back in the day, you know, you would have people in particular of my ilk, right, bankers, that have bullet points and numbers, and it was just horrific presentations. I always had pictures. I always had pictures, and I would speak the words, and the pictures were simply supporting uh, uh, graphics. And so I wasn't the first person to map an industry ecosystem, but I was amongst the earliest to do it in graphical form uh, yeah. by taking the logos of companies, because A, the see the previously mentioned uh, uh, better processing of graphics, and second is, I figured it played to the ego. See, this is marketing for all these companies. They get to see their graphic you know, on a page as opposed to just their name listed. So it was actually like any sort of great th thing that turns out to, to have significant impact. Started off completely different, right? I put together a page to try and comprehend these companies. The very first uh, landscape chart was 175 logos booked into, uh, into buckets where I was just trying to use it as an internal tool to understand what the hell was going on with this complex and dynamic uh, uh, e and fragmented ecosystem. So I put it together, I spent more time on it. The more people I shared it with, and Bill, you are amongst the earliest people that I shared uh, those yep. concepts with and got lots of feedback from people going, oh, actually not, no, they don't quite do that, they do this. And so I got expert crowdsourcing was, a, was something I learned. And we put this thing together and it just took on a life of its own. I presented it at a conference in 2010. And, you know, the rest, is they, as they say, is history. The funny thing is, you know, the, the original name uh, was the Display Advertising Technology Landscape. Um, and uh, that w when I left GCA, uh, which was a perfectly good firm with good people, but I found, you know, there was a much bigger opportunity that I could do on my own. Founded Luma in September of 2010, so we're coming up on the 10-year anniversary. Yes. Uh, and then fast forward to June of 2011, I had then come up with three more Lumascapes, the video advertising technology landscape, the mobile one, and the social one. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have the Wall Street Journal was going to print these, and they had this story, and I'd sent them in the graphics and everything. And I'm sitting there at like 7.30 going, wait, you know, the display advertising technology landscape, that's a mugful. Why don't I shorten that landscape, Lumascape? I'd already called my company Luma. I was trying to get brand recognition, build a global brand with no money. Hard to do, but um, I'm a big believer in content marketing. So what do I do? I called the journal. I'm like, you yeah, can't print. I said, I got new graphics. They're like, Deadline is at eight o'clock. Get them to us in the next 12 minutes. And so I did. I just redid them as Lumascape. They printed them in the Wall Street Journal in June 11, 2011. And the rest of it, they say, is history. Today, they've been viewed over 12 and a half million times from over 200 countries. Uh, there are now 22 Lumascapes mapping over 5,000 independent companies. I mean, it's just it's just blossomed into a, into a thing. Terry, one of the things that I think is actually uh, the un, you know maybe an untold story, or at least something that I observe in regards to Luma, is indirectly you you started off to solve a a, co a complex problem, just making sense of a landscape, which you realize other people appreciated. You figured out distribution. Clearly, you're good at graphics, so there's a nice combination in your favor. But what I think is really interesting is you know, creating the Luma and, and creating these charts necessarily isn't a way to monetize, but what I love about it is that it's indirectly, I love businesses that understand that what they put out from a content or marketing perspective, indirectly or directly can feed where you actually can monetize and where you can make money, where you can get transactions. And I, that's the part that I actually appreciate the most, uh, which is you don't sell the Luma chart, you give it away for free. And then right. all those dots connect to, oh, this guy's an um, investment banker. Oh, he works in New York. Oh, so that that's the part that I don't know if a lot of people think or appreciate, or maybe it's super obvious, but that's the part that I think is actually, interesting. Actually, it's interesting you, you say that. There's I, I think there's a big chunk, maybe a third of the people that know us for the Lumis game have no idea that we actually operate an investment bank that does mergers and acquisitions. Um, well, you, know, you like, heard it here first, folks, on the Super Power Podcast. Uh, so what's, what's, companies. What's, what's interesting, uh, about the funnel that that we've created, right? You, if you if you think of it, we're at the bottom of the funnel, and we're very, by definition, transactional in the sense that I only get paid on success, uh, only when a deal closes. If a deal closes, that's at the very bottom. And yet we recognize that, you know, like like all marketing, it's a funnel, 
And so think of the Loomis caves at the top of our funnel, free and ubiquitous, and, and, and thankfully, you know, utilized everywhere to get the name brand recognition out, ergo the sort of the Kleenex uh, uh, or Coke sort of uh, uh, brand name association. Um, but then, you know, we're also producing content. We do, you know, quarterly reports. We're always publishing uh, decks on all kinds of different topics because that's sort of like the next level down of engagement where we want to put that content out. We want it to be free. I remember my partners at GCA, when I started publishing these presentations I made, they said, wait a second, why are you giving that away? That's a valuable IP. And yeah. my first reaction was, well, valuable IP, that's good to know. I'll remember that at comp time. But, but the reality is, you know, if I presented that, in person, I could do that to 200 people, 300 maybe a year. This way I was getting up to audiences of 10,000 at the time and now it's in the millions. So they just didn't understand this concept of this of this funnel. We do that, we present at conferences that we get invited in by you know YouTube and Facebook and Oracle and yeah. you name it, Procter and Gamble to come in and talk to their leadership teams that builds relationship and, and then ultimately it feeds the beast, right? I mean, you, you get to do more deals because you've created that full funnel. And it's almost like, a, it's almost like a flywheel, Terry. You, you almost developed or built a full stack or flywheel in the sense of what a, how a technology th a company thinks about building their product. m and has always been very siloed. You've almost thought about it holistically that here's the stack or the flywheel Absolutely. as it relates to all things m and Absolutely. Hey, 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 Terry, talking about brand, um, talk about the name Luma. Um, some have some have said they think it's the first two letters of your two sons' names. Some think it's Luma stands for something else. Like what? What is it? So, uh, so here I was in uh, July of 2010. I've come to the. I've now made my exit from from GCA, and I've got to launch my own firm. And that means I need a brand name, right? I need a name of my firm, and I wasn't going to be Kawaja and Associates. That's uh, I'm a big believer in operating leverage. See the Piper Road uh, experience at age nine. So I knew that I wasn't going to name it after my last name. That's a huge mistake. Um, and so I uh, said, okay, you know, Nike, Puma, I mean, w w whatever. There, there's lots of brand. The shorter the name, the better. Um, Luma is the definition of a Luma is the amount of brightness in a video pixel. So brightness, brilliance, ideas, that all seemed to make sense. It also happens to be an acronym mashup for my two sons, Lucas and Matthias. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of like uh, clever, oh, yeah. cute, and boy, has that uh, worked? I mean, uh, yeah, it's worked. And, yep. and, and those, those names, just because we have to kind of touch on it, Terry. You, uh, I want to talk about your. Uh, you you have. We had talked about your boys. They sound. They don't. They, that doesn't sound like a Peter and Tom kind of name. They may sound like they come from a. South American. It, 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 it also doesn't sound Canadian. Yeah. No, so it's it, not really Canadian. Well, I had I had a couple of constraints. My wife is uh, from Brazil, and so uh, it had to be a name that couldn't be shortened, um, and that was pronounceable the same in English and Portuguese. So with those two constraints, we ended up with uh, Lucas and Matthias. Nice. Nice. Um, so, Terry, a couple more things as we kind of get get to the end of the show here. Um, um, how... I thought this was a 24 hour marathon. Yeah, no, no, it's a marathon. It's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Terry, it's, it's safe for our view, viewers right now. Um, I, I think, I think you know, as it relates to Luma and the Luma, Luma scape and, and kind of your background, um, some fascinating, interesting insights. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know, macro, how your firm and your team, great team, by the way, sees uh, the current world and current position that we're in as it relates to what you guys do day in and day out. I think it'd be a, it's something we obviously have to ask given this climate. I'm sure there's a yeah. lot of curiosity on that topic. Well, I, I appreciate your, your compliment. I absolutely do have the most incredible team. You know, we, we, we started small and we stayed small. So, uh, you know, the Luma team in total is, 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 you know, when people ask me about the size of Luma, I ask them, well, do you know Goldman Sachs? They're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, we're a little smaller. Uh, <laughs> but we punch way above our weight. Uh, and by sticking with just A-listers, I am, I am fortunate and lucky to uh, have the incredible cadre of, of partners and employees uh, that we do have at Luma. So thank you for that. Um, 
Look, I think this is a, uh, obviously it's a challenging time, but look, we've had challenges before and, and we'll have them again. So uh, this is a particularly, uh, you know, an unprecedented one to use a, a phrase, turn of phrase that seems to be ubiquitous these days. No. It is severe and there will be impacts. Um, uh, you know, M&A tends, so, so I'll go back to a comment I mentioned earlier, which is to say, it seems like this coronavirus, uh, coronavirus crisis situation has, has acted as an accelerant to what was otherwise happening uh, anyways. And in this ecosystem, as I'm gonna actually gonna be talking about in my webinar, this will probably come out afterwards, but my webinar on the state of industry consolidation I'm doing on, uh, on uh, April the 8th, we're gonna talk about how every industry goes through an arc. An arc of new company formation, sorry, uh, uh, maturity, and then rationalization and consolidation. Totally natural. Every industry goes through it. Yeah. Uh, in the 1980s, there was like dozens and dozens of ERP software companies. Today, there are six. And yeah. so, you know, it usually takes about 20 years, goes through this arc. The same exact thing will apply here to AdTech and MarTech. It's just that it's a little bit different in the sense that it's on steroids. Instead of dozens of companies, there are thousands of companies. That yeah. is a function of the fact that most of these businesses are virtual, right? There, there's no physical goods uh, because of cloud infrastructure and because of the uh, uh, you, you, availability of uh, venture capital. So you put all those together and you get this perfect storm where we created an industry, and by the way, a large industry and a rapidly growing industry. I'm talking billions of dollars where all you got to do to siphon off a small portion of that is to have some kind of slightly better uh, mousetrap, whether it be media, software, or or data, or what have you. And so, yes, you ended up with this bizarre concoction, this fragmented ecosystem of thousands of companies that took advantage of that available venture capital, and they all have a stake in the game. Well, obviously, that's too much, and we do need to sort of enter maturity and, and rationalization consolidation. Well, it turns out if you look at the numbers and like whether you're studying a virus or you're studying industry, an industry, look at the numbers, right? And the numbers show you that we reached peak venture capital, that is to say input of money into this industry reached a peak in 2014. Mm. We reached a peak in terms of exits, number of exits uh, in 2015. So since 2015, for five years, this industry has been in a position of net consolidation. Fewer companies being started, more uh, getting getting taken out or getting exited. And it actually follows that that arc almost like perfectly. It's sort of like scary how much it maps to a, a natural arc. And so, yes, for the health and for the good of the industry and the players in it, it is appropriate that we go through this era yeah. of rationalization okay. and consolidation. It's yeah. just that it's messy, very messy, when you start with thousands of companies. So um, what what will transpire here is whilst it's good for the industry, and we've been calling for the need for consolidation, not the fact that we happen to benefit uh, from intermediating uh, those transactions, but the reality is, I think the objective reality is the industry needed it. And listen, let's think about what happens. The consequence of consolidation means we have fewer players with greater scale that can have a much, much lower take rate and be super profitable. Yeah. Sounds healthy to me. It's just that for the individual entrepreneurs and venture investors, don't worry about the VCs. They're diversified in terms of their yeah, portfolio. Yeah, yeah. So make, shed no tears to the institutional shareholders. People will be, people will be impacted, which is the hard part. I, 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 entrepreneurs and so we're going yeah. through that now there's and, and that happens in two ways right outright company failure capitulation deals that those two will comprise sadly 95 percent of all exits yeah five percent if you look at the last 10 years five percent of the exits are the ones you hear about and read about yeah. and people brag about which are yeah. exits that achieve meaningful investor returns for the cap table and and build wealth for the entrepreneurs. Five percent. I know it's sort of not cool to talk about the realities of that, but 95 percent are learning experiences and loss making for the institutional investors. Well, I, I, I always like to say that in venture capital, it's like baseball. A 300 hitter uh, makes the Hall of Fame, you know. Absolutely. Uh, 
So three, if three out of 10 work, you know, and Chris, that's your business now. Um, hey, hey, Terry, I, I want to just change. I, I want to talk about two topics. Um, one, uh, you know, I think as people hear your story, it seems like, you know, you've, you're driven, you've had a tremendous amount of success, you know, you, you have, you know, vision, you have, it seems like you have fun doing it, but, you know, I'm sure over 10 years, uh, so since Luma is turning 10 later this year, I, I'm sure it wasn't all amazing. Um, I'm sure there are times. So talk to us about maybe, you know, the fact that, you know, I, I got to assume in your business uh, and because you are just a handful of people and you are the founder, you know, you, you may go months with with no income. Um, you're producing a ton of content. You're putting out Luma Skates. You're doing comedy. You're speaking at conferences, but you don't get paid unless uh, a deal happens. I got to imagine there are months where deals don't happen. Um, and talk to us about kind of cash flow and just and also talk to us just about you know, maybe some of the hard times you had over the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah no, listen, uh, you, you've seen those uh, diagrams, right, where it says you start here and success is here and it's not a straight line. That's the perception. The reality is the line goes all over the place to get there. And that's that's that's, that's always uh, uh, the case. Um, so I guess a couple things. One was the, the principles that I had at the formation of this firm were, were, were uh, in a, a number of them. One was the notion of real partnership. So um, I don't own the whole company myself. I have, uh, there's five partners uh, at Luma and because um, I believe in in giving people upside, including um, the uh, office manager, the, the my assistant who joined me while I was in my pajamas, right from day one, she got a meaningful stake in the company and that's materially changed her life because I believe in this notion of uh, a partnership team approach. Uh, that's Terry, number one. Number two. Susan, it's hard to interrupt you, but uh, adore her, love her, have seen how you've treated her uh, and, and as a as a partner. And I, I think people, if you haven't met Susan, meet Susan. Sorry, carry on. And, and, and by the way, uh, you know, Susan and I have been singing Les Miserables to each other for decades. Um, so then when you came out with those Les Mis parodies, I was like, there, that that's Susan's influence here. Absolutely, absolutely, she is. Uh, she is a force in nature, uh, and uh, that was one of the best decisions I ever I ever made. Um, it, it, and secondly, is look, this is a professional services firm, so I don't believe in the notion of outside capital. So we provided uh, yeah. our own uh, capital to support the business um, because just it just doesn't make any sense to have a services business and, and outside uh, capital. Besides, we wanted to maintain you know control of our destiny. Um, and so, yeah, you do get dry spells and, and oh, and sorry, so I suppose the third principle, and it probably had an impact in terms of how I scaled or, you know, managed the scale of our business. You know, we have a very, we have, I believe in having a low fixed nut, keeping as much operating leverage uh, in the business whilst yeah. also being able to sleep at night. And so uh, I'm able to do that because uh, we are not doing kind of our PL doesn't and our operating leverage doesn't look like the typical investment bank because they run a lot of processes and that requires a lot of junior people yeah. uh, and that's a big fixed nut, et cetera. We are not running processes. We're doing something more akin to strategic matchmaking. So when I talk about the, you know, 95% of the deals being sort of capitulation or uh, auctions for whatever you can get. We're not even in that business. The only yep. business we're interested in is the 5%. And that fundamentally changes the investment infrastructure uh, associated with our business, which lowers our fixed nut, which means we're able to go six months. We went nine months uh, of a dry spell and then boom, we're a very lumpy business. And then Incredible. started making, you know, big fees. So uh, you, yeah, you, and yet, you know, and you don't know it's gonna necessarily be there uh, so you kind of got us. So I guess that means set up your cap table, set up your financing so that you can weather that storm. And then yeah. secondly, is have an attitude of uh, of taking the taking the long the the, the long view. And you got to do that with some clients. You know, I've had some clients where you add a ton of value, ton of value, and then at the eleventh hour, they allowed their VC to come in and pick the investment bank that they wanted because it was some other IOU not associated 
with the company and and so you get screwed and i've been screwed a number of times yeah. and you know i decided there was two ways i could react to that one was you know vengeance and anger and 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 get pissed off at that entrepreneur but it probably wasn't their fault uh, um and so the other one was to ignore it keep just keep persist at it and i've had numerous cases where a ceo whose board was able to bring in a different advisor and i kind of got screwed down the road they remembered that i continue to maintain the relationship and it yeah. pays off a big time down the road so yeah. what i've learned is when i when you and that's another consequence of having you know you're starting your own business is you can take the long view uh, as opposed to take the short view and so many bankers uh just sort of go for that you know short-term maximization which is always a loser well, Terry, if things don't work out on the on the um, you know when things go slow and you have a nine month hiatus, there's always stand up. Uh, I don't know how that pays the Fifth Avenue rent. Um, I, I had one uh, w one final sort of question and comment, but it comes with a story. So when you and I, everyone always has their moment when they kind of break the ice and really get to know someone. I believe I uh, Bill and I that was in Bill's office when we kind of talked a lot of things personally including the divorce and we kind of that, I just remember that being a moment where we connected I remember you and I connecting um, on 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 a paddleboard expedition out in the Hamptons in Wayne Scott where we went so Bill we go you know about an hour um, uh, through Santa Ponic Pond to the beach we have a swim we come back and we talked at that period, I was going through a very difficult patch in regards to my company and pivoting and trying to sell. I had all these questions. Yep. And where I'm going with this is it's kind of a question, but it's also a comment, which is the question which you'll, I want you to answer in a minute is what's the biggest misconception of Terry? Terry's loud. Terry's out there. Terry's Terry. And the ones that know you know this authentic, very real person. You're always the first person that I think reaches out to people when they're going through a struggle. I can mention people's names. I'm not going to do that. But there's this very soft side, sincere human side, which I know, and I saw that on that paddle paddle journey with you. So um, at the end of that, I think you and I over a couple of Coronas, and um, that's what we were drinking. Um, that was kind of a tipping point for us. And that's when I saw another side of investment banker and boisterous loud Terry. So my point, bringing this all together, is what what do you think is the when you don't know Terry outside of the Luma and the parody videos, what is the misconception that people don't know about you, um, but they just happen to kind of see you in their feed? Well, I uh, probably probably that 95% of the things I do every day do not accrue to Luma's benefit in the sense that, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in this notion of giving, either whether it's giving to the industry in terms of, you know, like, you know, people have told us, I've had so much feedback saying, you could sell these reports, you could monetize it this way and that way. And I'm like, nah, no thanks. Even advertising on the parody video is like, no thanks. I don't want any of that. I want to stay objective. You know, the, the single best compliment someone can say about me is objectively credible in the sense that I don't want to be a shill like those other uh, bankers. And I also am a big believer of, look, you know, I, I feel like there's a little bit of a um, cognitive dissonance here where, where, yes, I just described an industry that's bloated and needs significant consolidation. I also said 95% of these companies are going to basically be flushed. Well, that doesn't, and, and yes, and I have a business, fortunately, that addresses the five, but that doesn't make me feel good, right? I mean, I have friends amongst the 100% and so, well, okay, fine, maybe not the bottom 20, but 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 the point is, there's a lot of people out there that I want to serve and help, and I'm not gonna be able to help them with my day job, that's reserved for the five. So are there things I can do? And yeah, there's a ton of things we can do. We sort of take it upon ourselves to be helpful educators. And one of the things that I've noticed in this industry, which is highly complex and everyone's kind of, there's a lot of pay to play, right? Yeah. Is that by being unfiltered, right? I don't have a boss and I don't have a filter. I can say things that others can't. And what I've found is, you know, if you're selling media or you're buying ads, right? You are kind of constrained in what you can say about either yeah. players or trends in the ecosystem because it doesn't serve your interest. I know I'm not constrained by that in any way, shape or form. And I'll just like, tell it like it is. I want the closest approximation to the truth. And it turns out that has tremendous value. 
when the a a says hey come in and talk to our marketers and i'm like i got nothing to do with it. i got nothing to sell to a marketer and i'll stand up on stage That's and really say, good i have nothing to sell you yeah so let me tell you what i think is going on and bam with no filter and they're like whoa holy shit and, and the co most common response I get was, that's what everyone was thinking in the room. Yeah. But yeah. No one was able to say it. So thank you for standing up and saying those things. And I think that is a, I hope that is a benefit and a value to the ecosystem. It's something we can add back. Yeah, uh, that. Because Love I know absolutely. that. Hey, hey, job yeah. doesn't help everybody. One of the other things I want to get in here, because we've alluded, we've, we've spoken about it many times, is, is the comedy. So do you remember what your first parody video was and what made you at the time think of it? Um, sure. It was, well, the, in, the, in the sort of latest incarnation, I've been doing comedy for 50 years. Um, so so there's, been, there's been lots of different things. But in terms of taking a song and changing the lyrics. Yes. And yeah, it was in uh, the end, it was December of 1980, uh, sorry, uh, December of 2007. And I just got a Mac for the first time. I was a PC guy uh, yeah. for a long time. Just got a Mac and I'm, it's a hall, Christmas break and I'm discovering uh, iMovie, right? I'm discovering all these new tools where I get to, it was fundamentally different than a PC, right? I got to sort of experiment with all these things. And at the time, uh, as you may uh, recall, we had just gone through a, really a tormenting year. The first half of 07 yeah. was a gangbuster year for M&A, and the back half was a total disaster where yeah. the, company was, the country was heading towards financial disaster. And of course, that got worse the next year. So yeah. I said, wow, what a year. I'm like, it's almost like, you know, you could make a parody out of that, and I did. I wrote a parody uh, song to a Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire, and that was Wall Street Meltdown. Yeah, yeah. That I put out in early 08, and then of course I had to do it again, Wall Street Meltdown Redux, uh, because the next year was even more crazy. Um, low quality graphics uh, on these those early days, but then in 2009, when it seemed like things were continuing to be horrific, um, I decided to do one for the media industry, the industry that I served, in advertising and i wrote mad avenue blues sung to american pie yeah and, um, th and i did it all in a day uh and it really truly did reflect sort of what was going on right media is in it in fact yep. i'm i'm i will stand by you know it's what we're 11 years since i wrote that parody uh you know quarter million people have watched it or something like that that stands up today yeah 11 years later so yeah, no, listen, I, so for those of you who have never seen one of these uh, parody videos, uh, I suggest you go to lumapartners.com, um, click on, I don't know, content or videos. Content. First, first go to superpowerspodcast.com yeah, yeah, and power. go to Luma. Hey, Terry, we have to, uh, we're going to wrap this up. I, I, the, Bill and I always struggle with this, uh, th these conversations because... It but really, the verdict, you got to come up with the verdict now. We do have to come up with the verdict, yeah. But, I'm going to let, let my esteemed partner uh, and co-host, Bill, uh, kick this off um, as we've kind of gone through this journey and we try to wrap up um, your unique superpower. So uh, so I've known Terry a long time. Um, I heard some stories today uh, that I never heard before. Um, I love talking about the young Canadian Alex P. Keaton uh you know him doing the uh you know the 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 seinfeld episode of taking the five cents and going to wisconsin he just happened to know about it uh that canada was changing their rules i love some i love hearing these stories uh and it and, it, and it's funny because now i'm picturing you as like a 13 year old you know and and like a little tie um but but here's here's the thing here's actually what i have long thought about Terry, which is uh, Terry uh, is an entertainer. Um, he loves to entertain. He loves to bring smiles to people's faces. Um, he, when he does something, he does, he does, he goes all in. And so um, I also think that if, you know, if he didn't live in Manhattan uh, and uh, have this uh, luxury lifestyle that he lives, I'm joking. Uh, you know, he, he, he would likely try to do that full time. The problem is for, you know, for 
you know, 99.99% of comedians, uh, comedy normally doesn't pay the bills. So, so I, I did a little research while he was talking just now. Um, and, and I'm going to, you know, just doing raw numbers. And I know he has five partners at Luma. But if you think about, you know, just on an average year, maybe you do six deals. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously, sometimes you do 10, 12 deals, 15 deals. Sometimes you do maybe a couple less. But if you say you do six or seven deals a year, and on average, those fees are three or four million dollars per pop, you know, it, you know, it, it, you, you get to be around, you know, 18, 24 million dollars. Now, if you look at that, um, I'm on Forbes list of comedians compensation for 2019. And I'm <laughs> going to read here. Um, uh, Amy Schumer, $21 million. Uh, Sebastian Maniscalco, who I love, $26 million. Right. So basically what you're talking about is, you know, Terry has found a way to channel his comedy, which rivals some of the best, which rivals Amy Schumer. He might actually make more money in comedy than Amy Schumer does. I'm, um, I'm, I'm aiming for Jerry Seinfeld. You know, and so so it's interesting. Trevor Noah, 28 million. I think you can you can probably catch him. He's number four on the list. Um, Jerry Seinfeld last year was number two on the list at 41 million. Kevin Hart, 59 million. It'd be hard for you to catch Kevin Hart, but and Jerry Seinfeld, but. You should be thinking about Trevor Noah uh, as like the next on the hit list. I am going. I am. I am going to say um, that Terry is the fifth, uh, fifth most most highly compensated comedian in the world, um, just behind Trevor Noah, uh, and that's his superpower. And his superpower is he found out that through investment banking he can become the number five com comedy comedian. And there you go. And there you go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, Bill. That was probably one of your 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 most creative and thoughtful uh, conclusions on these shows. So thanks for that. Yeah. So outside of the some of the obvious pillars of social awareness, a high degree of energy, um, I, a couple of things that, that also come to mind in regards to Terry's superpower. Um, I think the 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 story. First of all, I, this is like I, I'm I have to say this to my mother now. I mean. Yeah, yeah of course you do. Of course, so I'm three, three last comments, and we're closing out, Terry. And this is uh, you can go pop some bottles, and uh, who knows if we're ever this nice uh, again. Exactly. I think the great talk piece that you sh you shared a moment ago. It, it's something I've always understood, but I actually think that value for for so many people is a superpower. I think the truth does set us free. I think very few people can speak the truth. I think that is a superpower. But if mm -hmm. I had to just nail it and conclude it. This, you're, you're an amazing storyteller and everything that you can, storytelling today, if you look at the best brands and marketers yeah. or entertainers, you talk about and hear stories as the kind of the core component. I think yeah. you have a very unique ability to tell a story and it doesn't matter how good someone's idea is or where they want to go, but if you can't sort of illustrate it, whether it's through a video or through a graphic or a logo, it doesn't fucking matter. You're not going to yeah. be able to get people to consume. So I think you're an ama amazing storyteller uh, 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 as your superpower. And I, and I, and I hope that you reach the milestones, the, 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 the riches that Bill outlined both from, uh, from maybe the ego perspective, but also you get a bigger house out East and we can go party there. So with that, Terry Kawaja, on behalf of Bill and I and our viewers and superpowers podcast, we loved having you and thank you so much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me on guys. All right, stay safe. Best to, to your wife and kids. Superpowers.